Incredulous might be a good way to describe today's interview. We welcome TF Metal Reports' Craig Hemke and spent much of our chat discussing how peculiar it is that the Fed, and in fact all central bankers and the money men on Wall Street, and the media and government, continue to spin us a yarn about the causes of and solutions to the disaster that is our financial system. After all, the world is facing shortages. Commodity prices are closing at all-time high, inflation's everywhere, and the markets don't want to be anyone's friend right now. Is it so hard for the Fed to be honest with us and say that they just can't fix this? How will this even play out? Not well, says Craig. He tells us every once in a while the world wakes up and realizes the Fed is full of garbage. For him, when this happens, there's only one way for investors to turn, gold and silver. If you enjoy this interview, be sure to share it, tweet it, and to hit the like button. And if you haven't already, why not subscribe to Goldcore TV? Because this is one of many brilliant interviews we have for you. And if there was ever a time to be getting as much insight as you can, it'd be right now. With this in mind, I'm delighted to welcome Craig Hempke to Goldcore TV. Hey, Dave, nice to see you. Nice to meet you. It is an honor to be here. Likewise, likewise. So let's get straight into it. Inflation is on a rampage across the globe. The Federal Reserve are hiking. A lot of central banks are hiking and everything is crashing. Stocks are down. Bonds are down. Crypto is down. It looks like property even is going to take a hit. The everything bubble is bursting. And precious metals, which haven't even really been in a bubble, they've also had a bad couple of weeks. Something's got to give. Is the Federal Reserve and Jerome Powell, are they going to drive the US economy off a cliff? Or are we going to see a 180 and a return to quantitative easing? Well, Dave, I can take it from here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I can, that's going to take, that's, a, that's the meat of the question right there. That's where we stand here. Uh, in May of 2022. Um, You know, a lot of us uh, gold-centered sound money folks have been talking about inflation like this for over a decade, right? And finally, COVID kind of pushed everything into this direction. You know, they kind of, to use a COVID term, quarantined all those dollars a little bit that they printed in the original QE, kept it as excess bank reserves and stuff like that. But this time, man, it all, they flooded it out here in the U.S. and around the world. And now you're just seeing simple supply demand dynamic. I mean, you put out more uh, dollars than there are goods and those dollars chase the goods and prices go up. And there's really no end in sight. Uh, Crude oil, well over $100 again. Uh, The grains, uh, important foodstuffs here in the US all soaring to uh, multi-decade or all-time highs. Nothing that 50 basis points from the Fed can address. You mentioned the everything bubble. And I think that's important for people to understand because, you know, we all, a lot of people phrase it, you know, there was the dot-com bubble and then it burst. And so to re-inflate everything, the Fed made a housing bubble and then it burst. And so then to re-inflate everything, we eventually got this everything bubble. And uh, and now everything's going down. You know, it's from a traditional financial planning sense, you know, you're supposed to have stocks and bonds, you know, and your portfolio zigs and zags and yings and yangs. And, and instead, I mean, stocks are down, bonds are down, everything is down, which mm. I guess uh, gives credence to the idea of the everything bubble, right? Mm. All right. So then the question becomes, where do we go from here? Um, going back to about this time, maybe it was June, I think of 2020, when on my site, the TF Metals report, we first started talking about stagflation being the ultimate outcome of all this. And there's really, I think everybody's kind of caught on that that's the direction that this is headed. And this notion that Powell and the Fed will ever get interest rates, whether it's the one that controlled Fed funds or the bond market, above the rate of inflation, I I think is folly. Mm -hmm. The, The most analogous period to right now is something we went through just three and a half years ago. You know, the Fed had played these games, these rhetorical games for about five years, telling everybody they were quantitative tightening and they were going to normalize interest rates and the balance sheet and all this stuff. And everybody kind of played along <clears throat> until the yield on the 10 year note got to about three and a quarter percent in early October of 18. And the stock market fell eh, 10, 12 percent. And it kind of stabilized. 
Everybody started wondering what's going to happen next. And then when it started making new lows in the middle of December, it fell another 10% in about 10 days. And that led to what everybody now calls uh, the Powell pivot. And as we entered 2019, even though we'd had this, you know, crash in the Powell pivot that you can kind of see with hindsight, I guess, the forecasts were still in 19 from Wall Street, you know, five more rate hikes, a 10-year note going to 5%, all the same stuff they're telling you today, mm -hmm. okay? But the stock market had crashed and, they, and eventually the Fed had to choose to keep that going, you know, kind of lesser of two evils, you know, they were, okay, we'll go ahead and keep this going and hopefully the shared prosperity and wealth effect and all that kind of stuff. They'll make that choice again. They have driven every institution, uh, endowment, insurance company, pension fund, private and public, every institution into risk assets through their zero interest rate policy over the last decade. And so if they let, you know, if they, yeah, we're going to be staunch, you know, against inflation, we're going to hike 75 basis points four times in a row or whatever, you know, garbage they're spewing on any given day, they'll crash everything. So they'll take it to a point of max pain like they did, you know, in December of 18, and then they'll reverse. And it is that reverse, that Powell pivot number two that's pending. And the last thing I'll add to that, Dave, is when we've seen this in the past, you know, I've been running this website for a dozen years, and I've seen this now three or four times. It's when the curtain is pulled back and the world kind of collectively, suddenly understands that the, these central bankers are full of garbage. Mm. They're, they're lying to you. And that's when everybody, that's when they, just for a moment of time, everybody pays attention to the metals and the miners and you know the trillions of dollars of funds out there kind of flows into our sector. Uh, you think back to 2009, QE1 was supposed to be a one-off, right? Never to be happened. Oh, it's just a one-time thing. We're not monetizing anything, said Bernanke. And then in November, 2010, here came QE2 and everybody went, whoa, wait a second. And that's when, you know, silver went up three times and gold about doubled and all that kind of stuff. And we got into 16, they were playing the same games. And we had this eight month period where everything took off. Uh, most importantly, the one period I just mentioned in late 18 and into 19 and gold from gold went from what, 1240 to 2080 from uh, 18 into the middle part of 2020. And we're in that, we're getting close to, again, that point where the curtain gets pulled back. And that'll come later this year. What's, uh, that, that was actually going to be my next <clears throat> question. What's the, what's the inflection point? What's the, what's the point at which uh, the Federal Reserve say, okay, we can't do this any longer? Do you think it think comes it, later in the year? So do you think there's a couple of more rate hikes in this? Or what's going to trigger it? Are we going to see, uh, I don't know, the S&P down? down further down around 3500 or lower or right. what's the what's that what's the, the what's the straw that breaks the camel's back so well, that's the level that's the level i've been watching david actually i wrote about it a couple times uh i do a public article every month or every week that gets put out and i wrote about this a couple times back in april i mean when bill dudley who was the former head of the new york fed so i mean we're talking I mean, there are a few Fed officials that are a little more important than others. And Dudley, of course, now works for Goldman Sachs. Mm. <laughs> Big shock, right? But he said the Fed's goal was to inflict losses on the stock market to try to generate a reverse wealth effect, where if you feel poorer, uh, it'll cause demand destruction. And if you can take away the demand side of the equation, then maybe prices will come down. Well, I mean, if they're telling you they're going to do this, you know, don't fight the Fed, right? Mm. <laughs> so... Um, again, that period that is most analogous is three years ago. And in the middle of December, when the stock market took out its previous lows, which were around 2,600 on the S&P, it fell to 2,300 in 10 days. We took out the previous lows of around 4,100 mm, two weeks ago. Yeah. And the stock market's been kind of hanging in the balance. On previous occasions, you know, when the Fed has been forced to change, either 16 or 18 or in March of 2020, the S&P fell about almost exactly to its 200-week moving average. If we were to do that again, it'd be about 3,500. A drop to 3,500 on the S&P is another 15% from here. That would be a point that would freak the Fed out enough. So uh, until, I mean, if history is any guide, until the Fed is forced to make that choice, then they're going to continue to play these rhetorical games. And uh, that would be the thing to watch as we go through the summer. They're kind of like a, a, a petulant teenager at the moment, because they had been told for a long time, or commentators were saying inflation is not transitory. 
Um, this is here to stay. The Fed are behind the curve. They were saying, no, this is going to, this is going to go away. This is going to go away. We're, we're going to see the top of this and it'll ease back. And well, all of these factors will, will wash out of the market. They didn't. Then they were faced with having to raise rates. And now they've decided, okay, they're going to tackle inflation. They're, whatever shred of credibility that they have has been eroded at this stage. And it's going to be utterly destroyed um, when they're going to have to do a, a, a 180 in order to mm-hmm. save the US from a recession, which mm-hmm. they themselves have created. Where do we go to next after that? Right. That's that pulling back of the curtain that I was talking about. Yeah. Where, where you know, our sector, nobody pays attention to it. <sighs> you know, guys like you and me and, you know, a handful of others around the world. But I mean, why, how many people actually own gold and silver at this point? couple hundred thousand i mean not very many people i mean it's it's all the paper digital assets that people want and so we are greatly overlooked and the sector and what moves the price of gold is widely misunderstood Mm -hmm. and so every once in a while though again and again the most recent period being 19 through 2020 people you know the the greater investment world kind of wakes up to this and goes Wait a second, those gold people, they might be right. The Fed is full of garbage. And that's when they turn their attention to it. And all of a sudden everything, I mean, the whether it's gold futures, actual physical metal, mining shares, whatever, everything catches a bid. And it's such a small sector that things move, you know, like I said, gold went from what 1050 at the lows in 2015, or even in 2018, late 2018 was about 1240. Yeah. And then it went to 2080. I mean, that's 75%. So we could very easily tack on another move. And now from, you know, 1,800, 75% would take you to 3,000. Now you say that and people go, oh, yeah, that guy's a lunatic, $3,000. But again, it's it's not like those kind of moves haven't happened before. And so it's that period when the world realizes that, uh, that, you know, that they've been lying to you all along and that they turn that. Now, the the key will be this time, because it hasn't happened yet, that people finally go, wait a second. They really have been pulled. They're not, they, I mean, they, they, they're, they, I'm not going to be fooled the fourth time by this. Mm-hmm. And that bid gets sustained. We don't run out of momentum. We don't get people then distracted by, oh, now look, I'm going to put some money over here. Instead, we got people staying in precious metals, continuing to hold precious metals. And then the thing continues to build on it. But we haven't had that crisis of confidence yet. But one thing you said, Dave, I'll point out that Again, I wish I could claim credit for this, but I saw this on Twitter. If you've got to defend your credibility, as these Fed governors, I call them goons, as these Fed goons have been doing, to say, oh, no, yes, we still have plenty. If you have to tell people you have credibility, you probably don't have any credibility, right? (laughs) Credibility is just an implied thing. Oh, yes. If you got to remind people that you do, uh, you're on your last legs. (laughs) And so we think we're going to see a, a 180 turn back to quantitative easing. Um, that could come later this year. But that's going to further fuel the already rampant inflation, isn't it? Right. Right. That's, it, and it's a choice they're going to have to make. Yeah. Powell gets up there and makes it sound like he's a man of the people, right? Mm. All these Fed goons do. And they just, oh, well, we know that inflation is such a problem and blah, 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 blah. But their ultimate employer is too strong of a term, is the financial sector, the banks. So if you're going to rank a, like a hierarchy of needs of what the, you know, the Powell and, and Lagarde and everybody else want to preserve and defend, it's the financial sector first, not the average everyday people. You know, if you can drag them along, you know, with this pretend mandate of 2% inflation and full employment, okay. But the third mandate is to keep the plate spinning. <laughs> Okay, because and even in their minds, they think, well, if the stock market crashes and the economy goes into stagflationary recession, depression, even the people that don't own assets, you know, the regular folks that are renting and just trying to make ends meet, even they will suffer. So they can justify it to themselves to protect the financial sector by saying, well, but this actually helps everybody. And that's what they're, again, because they can't go the other direction. Uh, and that's why they'll do it. Because the other direction is 
total and utter destruction of the economy. Right. But but exactly. it's, is, is it not a case of it's total and utter destruction of the economy quickly as opposed to total utter destruction of the economy slowly? Slowly, right, which is what they've been doing now for 51 years. Right. Yeah. Slowly. But it, again, uh, yeah, I, I reference again, I've been doing this for a dozen years, this this the side of mine, the tagline, you know, like a book will have a tagline, mm. you know, the title and then the tag. My tagline has always been we're preparing for the end of the great Keynesian experiment. Mm. Right. Where you could just have the system based on debt. And if you can grow fast enough and keep increasing the debt to service your prior debts that, you know, the thing somehow keeps going, but we're rapidly reaching that point. You know, you've heard people say $1 of new debt only creates 20 cents of GDP growth, that kind of thing that mm -hmm. these Keynesian economists say. We're at the point where it gets so exponential that it gets out of control. And <clears throat> maybe the, the easiest way I've always found to explain this uh, to folks, you know, that are just simply trying to live their lives and prepare for what these eventualities are, is think of like the U.S. budget. I mean, I think most people know here in the U.S., we got about $30 trillion of outstanding debt. And we're adding to that now at a rate of about 10% a year. Mm -hmm. But even at $30 trillion, they've run the, um, the average interest rate, effective rate on that down to under 2% by the zero interest rate policy. So the line item on the national debt of the, in the budget is about $500 billion to service the existing debt. Well, what if that interest rate doubles? Yes. Yeah. Now you got a, a, a trillion dollars just to service the debt. What if this, yes, we're going to let rates normalize and go to 5%. Now it's a trillion and a half. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's getting to the point in a recession where the interest cost of servicing the debt gets pretty close to what your total revenues are mm -hmm. if revenues fall off. And that's where the whole scheme begins to collapse. And they'll have, they have to make that choice. And that's just, I mean, that's just the simplest sliver of national debt what about state you know uh public debt city debt municipal debt private debt mortgages all these kind of things and so there this again it's what amazes me and i guess maybe it's more just a shared self-interest that cnbc and bloomberg and the wall street sell side people and all the investment banks they all play along and keep promoting this narrative again i guess probably out of a shared self-interest because it's so obvious that it's not true. Yes. You know, that rates are going back to 5%. Everything would absolutely implode if it did. Yes. Yeah. That the, the debt becomes totally and utterly unserviceable. Right. It, 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 you've had such exponential growth in debt at such low levels of it that even now at this stage, small increments in that rate right. are catastrophic. It's why we see, I suppose, each cycle um, each credit cycle that we see as credit goes higher and higher, the ability of central banks to raise interest rates becomes less and less and less Correct. each time. Correct. So they're highly sensitive to, 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 to interest rate um, changes at this stage and right. just can't tolerate it. So in that situation, um, what we've seen over the last while, the one thing that has particularly stood out um, is the US dollar uh, as an asset. Mm -hmm. uh, if we look at the dollar index, uh, we look at it against all the major currencies. It's it's performing well, so it's fulfilling that role of uh, safe haven, you might say, uh, mm -hmm. in in a in a world where everything is is crashing off. In the situation that you're talking about here, in a return to quantitative easing, a, a one eighty degree turn by the Fed, um, and this effectively embracing rampant inflation um, in order to prolong the, the the fallacy of the US economy for longer. Do we start to see a reversal then in the US dollar um, oh. and, and, a, and a significant decline from here? Yes, it will be the dollar's turn in the barrel, right? And mm. That's all part of the kind of the fallacy of the markets, if you yeah. will, at this point, right? Um, my friend, uh, uh, the Englishman, Ned Naylor Leyland. I don't know if that's somebody you know, money Dude. manager. Um, Ned famously coined the term that the future's tail wags the spot dog, right? Yes. And the futures market, which is you know just these mostly unbacked derivatives, are traded by these computers, which take their trading cues, you know, they're pre-programmed to buy or sell gold futures, 
mm-hmm. based off things like movements in the dollar and you know the bond market, things like that. And a vast majority of the trading volume every day is are these high frequency trading computers. Well, think about how silly. Well, one, just the notion that somehow the physical price is determined through the trading of baseball cards <laughs> is is ridiculous, and that will one day change. But think about how silly it is that um, if you kind of walk that through to its natural conclusion, what's the dollar index? Dollar index compares the fiat dollar versus these other similarly devaluing fiat currency. For this moment in time, yeah, there's kind of a safe haven bid because I don't want to invest in anything because everything bubbles popping. So I'll just, you know, park it in some currency that's going up, whatever. Um, But on a bigger picture, the dollar is going up because the euro is going down. The euro is 57 or 8% weighting in the dollar index. And why is euro going down? Well, because they're stuck. He used to be really stuck. Uh, and, and, and the yen is going down, which is another 10, 12% of the dollar index. And why is that? Because the yen, the Bank of Japan is stuck. They're trying to defend their yield curve control policies and they're staggering. Heck, Dave, we just found out yes, uh, back when, a couple of days ago that the tick, in the tick data, the Japanese sold something like $70 billion of treasuries in the month of March wow. because they're raising cash to defend the yen. Okay, so all these other currencies are weakening, which gives you the impression by default that the dollar is strengthening of strength and, and, and another way of looking at it is, is all of these currencies are weakening and the dollar is weakening it's just weakening at a slower rate than all the other right. currencies so it's so respectively it's uh it's it's strengthening right so so again the folly of it then is that these machines see the dollar going up and they sell gold futures mm-hmm. well wait a second Gold is clearly improving versus all these fiat currency. Just because one is going up a little bit relative to the others should not make a rational carbon-based person, a <laughs> trader, <laughs> sell their gold. And nobody's selling any gold. I mean, gosh, the premiums for gold and silver here in the States are just outrageous. Yeah. But everybody, you know, these machines trade their futures contracts and that drives the spot price uh, as well. And so it's just, it's such a weird time. I'm confident though. And, and I mentioned, um, this, this is why, this is why you, uh, you're, you're seeing this gold or this precious metals weakness at this moment right. in time, a large contributing mm-hmm. factor to that. I mean, and yes. And the, you know, the other thing historically, that's a big driver of, of gold prices there's a very tight correlation over the decades is the level of real interest rates, mm-hmm. you know, inflation adjusted interest rates. Uh, what's remarkable is these machines and your Wall Street guys and the bullion banks and everybody that puts out research on gold, they've decided over the years that real interest rates should be measured not against the current level of inflation and interest rates, but instead inflation expectations. <laughs> As if expectations okay. are ever right about anything. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Right? And so now they're trying to tell you that, oh, no, real interest rates are positive. What? Wait wait a second. <laughs> the 10-year note's at 3%, and, in, and inflation's at 9 <gasps> No, 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 they're positive because 10-year inflation expectations are at 3%. Well, wait a second. That's <laughs> never gonna... And so that's, again, it's like the dollar. That's the folly of the rationale for dumping you know, these digital gold contracts. And it, it, it really is maddening, um, but it can be, if, you un, if you're comfortable with the math, if you think for yourself, as most gold people do, then you can kind of see through this. You can recognize it for what it is, and you can use the system against itself by you know, going to gold core hmm. and getting yourself some physical metal. I mean, there's no way gold should be $1,800 an ounce. And it will not be $1,800 an ounce going forward, you know, if you want to go a year out, three years, five years out, whatever. And so use it to your advantage um, that you can still afford it when there's really nothing else that you can afford. Uh, I'm going to put you on the spot for a second, Craig. Sure. Um, if you were in Jer- Jerome Powell's shoes now, what would you be doing? I would quit my job and go to work for Citadel. <laughs> is that a good that, that's what, uh, look i cannot i was stunned 
when he announced he was going to go for a second term and he just got confirmed a couple of days ago, I thought, what an idiot. He, why would you? And the only thing, I, the only reason I think that he would sign up and do this again for a second term is he believes his press clippings. Yeah. You know, it used to be, and Dave, I'm sure you remember this. I mean, back when I was a stockbroker 30 years ago, the only time you ever heard from the Fed was when a Greenspan would go up to Capitol Hill every six months. Indeed, yeah. And that was it. <gasps> and now if there's an open mic, one of these goons from Cash Carry to Bullard to Evans to Mester, to, you name it, they're going to grab it. And they, they've all been taught a conditioned, if you want to use a psychological term, to think that they are the masters of the universe, that they control everything. And I think the only we, I, reason I can come up with why Powell would want to keep the job for another four years is because he, think, he believes it, that mm -hmm. he's omnipotent, that they can fix this through their, you know, their little dials and spinners of monetary tools. He's, drink, he's uh, drinking the Kool-Aid. He's drinking his own Kool-Aid. Yeah, yeah. Because they... Uh, Remember when we first started, I mentioned crude oil. Yeah. Okay, as we record this, crude's about like 112 or 13 dollars. It, it's moving toward its highest daily close since September of 2008. Yeah. Okay. It's a major problem, uh, not only just in terms of price, but here in the US specifically, we don't have enough refining capacity. And so a choice is being made between making jet fuel, heating oil, gasoline. Um, uh, he, oh, I said he, he definitely diesel fuel. Okay. You, you got one molecule. You can only crack it once. <laughs> okay. So all these distillate prices are going through the roof. There are uh, pending shortages and rationing of diesel fuel on the East coast. Well, what the heck is that going to do for inflation? Right. And people are going to freak out, right. When all of a sudden the shelves are bare and all that kind of stuff. Then we've got grains. I mentioned that earlier, soybeans, wheat, corn, Mm -hmm. They're all at, at uh, almost all time highs uh, already because fertilizer costs are through the roof and all that kind of stuff. Corn goes into everything, not you know, high fructose corn syrup and every processed food, but it's a feed for livestock too. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's no amount of, well, yes, we're, well, we're trying to decide between 50 and 75 basis points. It doesn't matter. And what if we get a drought in the U S this sure. summer? Okay, so I, I just they this notion that as masters of the universe, they can fix all of this through their, you know, kind of very minimal tools of playing with the Fed funds rate and stuff like that, just not going to happen. And then again, ultimately, all the way back to the beginning, they have driven everyone and everything into risk assets. I mean, you think of a ins typical insurance company used to buy treasuries and high yield or regular corporate bonds, AAA rated stuff to hedge their risk, you know, and actuarial stuff. They know how many people are going to die and all that kind of stuff. And all of those insurance companies are now in risk assets because they, can, they can't make their models work at a one and a half percent 10 year note. So, and then they think of the local pension fund, your local pension fund, you've got this where you live, right? Yeah. All these pension funds that have these goals are trying to make 8% growth a year to, to cover all these pensioners that they've got to pay for until they die. Well, you can't get 8% in the bond market. So they've all been driven into stocks and high yield bonds. If it, if it collapses, it, it is going to be a, and they cannot allow it. They're, so they can play these rhetorical games up to a certain point. And then they will absolutely guaranteed 100% have to shift. And when they shift, man, that's, that's going to be the time for the metals to shine again. And it's coming. It's coming sooner than people think. And they'll have to, when they shift, they'll have to shift big as well. So as you're, as you're saying, like, let's take uh, the, the Russia-Ukraine uh, war at this moment in time. That's 10% of grain um, mm -hmm. off the market. Mm -hmm. You can't tackle that by increase in Fed funds rate in the US by right. 50 right. basis points. That's not going to do anything for that. That problem is there and it's about to come through the system. Right. The, right. it's it's interesting i asked you that question about what you'd do if you were in jerome powell's shoes and i've asked the same question of a lot of people um and they all give a similar answer uh and the reason is it's not because they don't know what to do because they don't have the wherewithal to 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 think of a solution it just seems there is no solution to this right that's true and, and that's, that's I, I, you you've hit the nail on the head and that's, that's the simple fact of this isn't it mm -hmm. 
And it's mm-hmm. a case of this is going to play out. But well, and how quickly? That's the that's that's the ultimate question. You you mentioned confidence mm. uh, and the ability to pull this trick and another through another cycle. Um, on May or I'm sorry, March the fourth, Friday, March the fourth, the yield on the ten year note closed at one seventy four. Over the weekend of March fifth and sixth is when the U.S. kicked Russia out of SWIFT and seized about four hundred billion dollars of their offshore currency reserves. Since then, and that again, that tick data I mentioned earlier uh, displays this. I mean, I'm not just making this up or pulling this out of my rear end. Mm. Um, every almost every government around the world has been a net seller of treasuries. Okay, what if you know that lesson's been learned? What if you're the Chinese who are now have the lowest treasury holdings in ten years, and they go, uh, well, now that they've shown their hand, we don't want to be put in that position. Yeah. So. As rates rise and then as they need to come back down to keep the plate spinning, what if there are no buyers? What if the Fed is the only buyer at that point? Mm -hmm. Well, now we're talking, it ain't just going to be whatever, what was it, $90 billion a month in treasuries that they were buying or 80 or whatever, 80 billion, what it was from March until recently. It's going to be twice that. Because, you know, of this debt, the existing debt, the refunding of the current debt, the new spending that's got to come out, and there are no buyers. So, you know, when people say QE on steroids, and you mentioned the war, that's why I bring this up, that a lot of things have changed <laughs> since they pulled this trick, you know, 10 years ago, or even since they pulled this trick three years ago. Mm-hmm. There can be no assurance that all they got to do is, well, we'd like to have rates come back down now, we're going to start QE, that anybody else is going to show up and bid for U.S. Treasuries besides the Fed. And at that point, you know, you're into Banana Republic territory and a loss of confidence, and that's when the bid for precious metals doesn't go away yeah. and it actually continues and gets stronger and, and one of the reasons it gets stronger is exactly because of that because those yeah. that would have been try- buying treasuries in the past as a way to uh-huh. hold their dollar reserves are now saying how else can i hold my dollar reserves well right converting them into metal seems uh the argument for that is an awful lot stronger now than it has been in the past and we've already seen that um happening with uh with russia right right and, you know, and, and it, it comes all the way down to just you and I and everybody listening to us, because we're kind of in the same boat as big institutions or even central bankers. Mm. You know, if I've got some money left over at the end of the month because uh, things are humming at my website, I, I can keep it in dollars, I suppose. Yeah. I mean, it's I haven't noticed yet that even though credit card rates are still 20 percent and Prime rates moving up past four. I haven't noticed my bank paying me any interest yet. Anything? Yes, indeed. Huh. How about that? <laughs> and so at some point you look at it and you go, okay, uh, let's take the case of physical silver. You know, um, they've beaten silver down here to $21. What's the downside from here? Well, yeah. I don't know. The all in sustaining cost for a lot of miners is $20 plus. Yeah. You know, where they're just going to stop. I mean, you don't immediately put your minds on care and maintenance, but you at least go, yeah, this is, we're not a charity outfit here. <laughs> so then the supply falls off. So what's your downside? And maybe the machines run it down. Maybe they just keep dumping the futures and the market bifurcates and all this kind of stuff. But what's your upside? I mean, even if it's only $25, mm-hmm. uh, that's still 20% up. Mm-hmm. It would take me what till the year 2,500 to make 20% in my checking account at this point. <laughs> Right. So um, that even at the personal individual level, uh, out all, you know, notwithstanding all of the sound money arguments and everything that else goes with it, saving in precious metal uh, is a pretty good idea, especially after, you know, what the machines have done to prices over the last month. Indeed, indeed. Before we wrap up here, Craig, can you tell us where our viewers can find out more about what it is that you do? Well, I I pointed up at this thing a couple of times. I've run this site for about a dozen years. Um, I I tell everybody on my site, I'm kind of their eyes and ears so that, because everybody's busy. Dave, I'm sure, I mean, you got stuff you got to do, right? After Mm -hmm. this. And the people on my site, it's a global community of people, diverse backgrounds, politics, but we're all in the same boat, right? About where this ship is headed. And, And, but everybody's busy. 
trying to care for their kids and their parents and make a mortgage and, you know, all this kind of stuff. So I sit here and stare at my screen like this all day long, <laughs> trying to make sense of it all. I write a report in the morning uh, and then a, record a podcast in the afternoon. It's uh, $15 a month. So it's, it's affordable. I, if you don't mind, I, I just did an interview yesterday where the guy wanted me to give a coupon code. So if you want to join us, enter the coupon code CFTC for the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. Super. You'll get half off for the first month. Uh, so all you got to do is check out, you put in the code CFTC, you get half off. But um, it's the site, I'm just, one, I'm extraordinarily blessed, as, as painful as it is to watch this stuff most days. I'm extraordinarily blessed that 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 this is my business, and the site. I think I think the people that are on there. I mean, we've got people that've been on there since the beginning. That they just find it valuable. If anything, yeah, okay, maybe I help a little bit with some guidance as where the markets are going. But they just being a part of a community of like-minded folks when the internet and COVID has driven everybody into such isolation, and then and then when you do find something, you get this. Um, I think just the community aspect is probably what people value the most. So anyway, tfmetalsreport.com. Perfect. And uh, are you on Twitter? Yes, uh, at tfmetals. And it's the weirdest freaking thing. It's like 52, I have like 52,000 followers. Ooh. It's a strange, it's just weird. <laughs> to. Th I mean, one, it's wonderful, right? I, if I something comes to mind and I want to send it out to have potentially that many people see it, but I'm just this, I'm nobody, man. I'm just a guy out here in the middle of the US that, you know, is paying attention to stuff. I, it's just weird that in the year 2022 that I have a platform like that. But anyway, um, yeah, long answer. Uh, you've gotten a lot of those today, Dave. Indeed. It must be the coffee. Um, <laughs> uh, at, at TF Metals is uh, the Twitter handle. Well, you're not nobody to us, Craig. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. I'm going to put a link to your website and your Twitter handle in the description and show notes below this. And I'll actually also put that coupon code down there. So anybody that uh, is interested in that, I highly recommend checking out Craig's stuff. But Craig Hankby, thank you for joining us on Goldcore TV today. It has been an absolute pleasure, my friend. I hope we can do it again sometime soon. Indeed, we will. Don't forget to take Craig up on his coupon code. We've popped it in the show notes below for you. If you, like me, appreciate Craig's insights into what's really happening, then may I point you in the direction of last week's interview with The Economist, Simon Hunt. Now, Simon flies under the radar a bit, but don't let that put you off. This is a man with decades of experience examining the intricate relationships between countries. His thoughts on the Russia-Ukraine war are sobering, to say the least, but definitely worth taking the time to listen to. We're big believers in taking control of your finances, because... As Craig has just demonstrated, no one else will. If you want to start taking steps to invest in gold and silver, then please log on to goldcore.com and explore the many ways we can assist you. Holding tangible, allocated metals really is the best way to show respect to your hard-earned cash and preserve it in the years to come. Thanks for joining us again today, and we'll see you next time on Goldcore TV. Don't forget to hit subscribe to be sure you don't miss any of our conversations with market-leading experts, commentators, and investors. Thank you.